This episode is powered by Banzoogle, the easiest all-in-one website platform for pro musicians and bands. You know who controls all your social media followers? Of course you do. Social media companies control who sees what and when they see it. Two things that will help ensure you're in control of your music business and your fan-based community are a website and an email list. Banzoogle can help you with both. Plus, a solid website makes you look legitimate. Serious musicians, singers, songwriters, composers, and performers know this to be true. If you don't yet have your own website, check out Banzoogle. It was created by musicians for musicians. I use it and I love it. It's as easy as easy to use gets and you don't have to worry about updates for things like plugins and security patches. Banzoogle takes care of that for you. The features and support are both incredible. See for yourself. Go to Banzoogle.com to start your 30-day free trial. Use the promo code Robonzo to get 15% off your first year. Plans start at just $8.29 a month. That's Banzoogle.com Com, promo code Robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to start your free trial today. Let's do the show. This is The Unstarving Musician. I'm your host, Robonzo. On this podcast, I have conversations with independent music artists and industry professionals intended to help indie artists be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love make music. Would you like to help other independent musicians find this podcast? Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast service. It really helps. The Unstarving Musician podcast is made possible through the generosity of listeners like you. One of the easiest ways to offer support is to join the Unstarving Musician community. Just go to unstarvingmusician.com and join right there on the homepage. As a member, you'll receive from me tips and lessons you can use in your music journey. And this isn't just coming from me and my years of experience as a gigging musician. It also comes from the wisdom of hundreds of other musicians I've talked to as part of the Unstarving Musician project and podcast. You'll also get a free copy of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs ebook, and that's all free just for being part of the community. To learn more about other ways of offering your support for the podcast, please visit our sponsor page at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor. Hello, Starlings. Thanks for joining me for another episode. This is the second installment of the series I've recorded on today's indie musician and the many skills we need to have to make it. These episodes were done as research for an article I wrote for Forbes.com recently. You can find a link to that article in the show notes or just Google six skills all indie musicians need today. Maybe add my name, Robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O. Before I get to the conversation with my guest, though, I want to tell you something, or share something with you anyway. I, uh, I bought a, uh, the digital copy of Dark Days Indeed featuring Jace Everett, who's most widely known for his um, Bad Things, the song that became the theme for the HBO series True Blood. Interesting voice, interesting musician, interesting guy. Anyway, the proceeds of this recording, Dark Days Indeed, will be donated to the Black Lives Matters What Matters 2020, or hashtag What Matters 2020, uh, which is a campaign aimed to maximize the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement by galvanizing Black Lives Matter supporters and allies to the polls in 2020s. U.S. presidential election to build a collective power and ensure candidates are held accountable for the issues that systematically and disproportionately impact black and underserved communities across the nation. I think that's a good cause. Um, Jace, I love it. Keep up the good work, man. If you would like to pick up a copy and make a donation, you can find Dark Days Indeed on Bandcamp. Just search for Jace Everett, or you can find a link in the show notes of this episode. So my guest is Mark Phoenix, who was also featured back in episode 31. Interesting artist with an interesting career history. As with the first part of this series, which featured virtuoso bassist and online educator Ari Cap, Mark and I discuss my various suppositions about the things that are most important for today's indie artists to know to be familiar with those things being skills that we need to have 
Among those discussed are marketing, branding, community building, live streaming, home recording, distribution, and entrepreneurship. And I, I ramble on about my new experience with recording drums at home, which I talk about frequently these days, but it was especially fun to talk about with Mark because of his history as a producer and studio engineer. Mark's long career gives him a compelling perspective on the topic of uh, skills that indie musicians need today. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, here is me and Mark Phoenix. I claim that today's indie artist needs to be, uh, to have an established um, following an online presence to be considered by most PR, record label, and artist management or management professionals. Um, it's, yeah, it would be the exception if not, yes, I would totally agree. And because, you know, it's like the old, when, when I moved to LA in 96 or something like that, and we tried to play a club, they said, what's on your mailing list or your, you know, that was a good old paper mailing list that you mm -hmm. call people to gigs. And now it's just online, the same thing, but in the virtual world. So, so even in 96, though, that's a good point. In 96, it was important. Do you think that, and maybe you just said this and I d didn't quite catch it, but Back then, it was your 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 snail mail list, which was very important. And now it's not only uh, well, it is. It's a social following. It's a mail list. They want to see sort of demonstrative examples of how you've marketed yourself. Would you say it's sort of there's a lot more that you have to show? Um, I think the the last twenty years have been leading to the. That the musician and artist has to become an entrepreneur as well, right? So it's way beyond the scope of making music and being discovered. Even then, you had to build your following and then maybe someone picked you up. But that whole middle class of artists is gone where labels could invest into 100 artists and two really, really paid for the 98 who didn't recoup. So now you have it in your own hand. But for someone to pick you up, I don't even consider that a real scenario unless, I mean, when is that ever that case? except someone is already established in other ways. Like okay, you're part of a TV show or something like that. So I think, right. I think the path is not to getting a deal anymore. The path is to creating your own business and your own branding and then make a living with that. And maybe then someone's going to come invest in you and help you out. So I That's think it's, the model has changed. Yeah, good point. Um, well, well put. Okay, and the other one is, <clears throat> or the next one is... Um, Sorry, it was a long answer. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. You said something that has been on the tip of my tongue and that was about like, you know, it's changed such that the music artist has to be an entrepreneur now. <laughs> and, and I talk about it all the time, but I hadn't quite put it in those words. So that was quite Can nice. I add something to that? Yeah. Like we, we used to, and I did that, you know, I moved to LA to, with the hope to be discovered, getting signed and, and things like that. So you, now it's maybe more the illusion that we want to go viral and we have this video that, you know, it's seen millions of times and then we discover it, but it's not even, that's the same illusion because that's when the work starts again, because you have to be consistently building a follower and even likes and followers are not, not enough. You need to get engaged followers, which is, you know, that's the, you, you need a community <laughs> mm -hmm. and the community responds and communicates with each other, not just likes it. And that's, that's not someone you can sell something to or share your music with, you know? Yeah. So that's, that just came to mind. Sorry. That's very good. Um, and this very much uh, is in line with what we're already talking about, but I'm, I'm also contending and writing about the fact that um, artists need to be a lot more savvy about uh, branding, uh, marketing, of course, which we were talking about, and which you mentioned community building. Um, well, on the good side is that we actually have access to fans so if whatever music you might do, there is a, at least a niche audience out there, if there's somewhat decent quality on the product, then it's just a matter of finding these people. And before you couldn't do that yourself, but now with, you know, by the means of Facebook knowing so much about people, you can really find targeted audiences. And so that's an amazing tool we didn't have before. It takes some, again, effort and learning, but it's something that, that's amazing. So that's the, the upside of all that. It's way more work and way more diversity in, in your work schedule. As you know, when you do a podcast, it's not just about talking in front of the microphone, it's all the technical stuff that goes with it. Same for musicians, right? Not just recording the music, but then 
all the other elements of the social media and all that. So that's sort of for the community building, I think just a tool we need to use. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, and then I was also saying that although live streaming was becoming very important prior to the COVID-19 crisis, that now music artists almost have to and will most likely have to understand and leverage it, um, the, especially those who've been resisting it for various reasons, or just, you know, I think I get the feeling that some artists are just like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. But what do you think about that? Um, I can't put myself in the shoes of someone who's been touring for years and years and is so used to a live audience because it's just a, a magical <laughs> scenario where you, have, you, you sp respond to each other, right? So for them to go to just a live streaming must be quite difficult or different at least, to say the least. Yeah. So I cannot really relate to that because I have always been the one in the studio and then occasionally playing out. So I am kind of used to be in this virtual domain so it's, it's a little hard for me to, you know, speak for those. Um, I do think, though, I don't, I don't think life will go away. We just have to reinvent the way we do it and maybe adapt a little bit with the, all that. Um, yeah. did, I, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I, I have in my current draft of the article, I was saying, making some comments that, you know, it may be the live music will come back. And it may be though that we have to look at it differently and and um it might be things where we're partnering with with venues or some other entities um in a you know in a less crowd centric uh performance, mm -hmm. but something where um I don't know, there's a new ecos the ecosystem is slightly changed and you know, where unfortunately the big crowd is not so big anymore or maybe non existent in some cases, but we're we're doing unique kind of um, collaborations that we just haven't had or needed to do, haven't had the opportunity or needed to do yet. So, yeah. That's but can, good. You, can you seriously imagine that that sports events and and entertainment events going to go away? I mean, is, well, can you, can you picture that? You know, one of the things that uh, this guy I mentioned, ba Balaji mm -hmm. Srinivasan, um, was saying that the cost of assembling a crowd just went up. Uh, exponentially with just insurance costs alone um, mm. to have a big crowd. So I don't know, you know, the, the economics of it are suddenly very difficult. Um, but, and he even, they even said later that we, we may very possibly be look back on those things with nostalgia because they just don't exist in the world that we have entered into, but which will be Do weird. You yeah. Agree with that. Concur with that. Well, I don't know. I'm terrible at predicting the future. It's a, uh, it's an interesting thought I have. I, I do not believe as a lot of people I know that, you know, gatherings are going to come back very soon. Uh, I think they're go we're going to keep trying and we're me personally, I think we're going to keep trying, which is not a good idea right now, but we'll keep trying and we'll see the result is not good. And so we're going to be forced to just adapt, but we'll see. I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not good at predicting. <laughs> but we can look at patterns, right? Yeah. Patterns are the, the best indicators we have. And after every stock market crisis, after every real estate slum, or even after every virus pandemic, it takes a good one and a half years to start coming up again. It comes up stronger again. So I don't know. I would be surprised if humans are not, you know, cutting their losses and come up strong in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's possible. Because, you know, it's unfortunately, and maybe fortunately sometimes, but Changes orient like often financially motivated, and if there's too many people that lose money with no entertainment and things like that going yeah. on. Yeah, I think we have to make it work somehow. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, we learn something and make it better. You know, it's like it's like traveling. I'm thinking if everybody travels a little less for pollution pollution purpose and all that, but then maybe we pay a little bit more, it will be actually really a really smart idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so. Um, we, we've already kind of touched on this a little bit too. Um, you mentioned the whole entrepreneurial thing, but do you have any thoughts on what I believe to be fact, you know, the, in, uh, when is a fact, you know, that, that artists now they have to understand how to use all these new platforms <laughs> for community building. And in some cases, well, in all cases, learning, and in some cases, teaching, um, and that 
the reason I bring it up too is because kind of like you said, we're not just musicians anymore. Suddenly we're entrepreneurs and we're learning all these things. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think in the matter of, or in the context of evolution is whoever is um, able to adapt will survive and hopefully thrive too. It's just another pattern, right? It's very obvious. And if we learn to go more vi uh, uh, virtual, if you will, or online as teachers, as educators, as musicians, then we have a much better chance. And I think then there will be a new, there will be new businesses. Others will shut down. The typewriter will be gone, but then we have the computer and other things taken over. And I think that's what's going to happen with music. It is already happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indeed. I mean, where I used to work, Musicians Institute in Hollywood, they did this whole quarter um, online. There's a whole college, you know, and I'm sure many did because they had to. And so they couldn't have imagined that if crisis would not. Yeah. Did, did, did those, um, this is a side note, but I think uh, maybe a friend of mine attended that school years back. Did they teach recording and, you know, like engineering at that school? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, I think he, he graduated from there and he had a um, career with Dallas Sound Labs as an engineer and sometimes producer. And now he's, um, these days he works with uh, a company that does animation for film. So like they, mm -hmm. they just did the new Scooby-Doo movie and they've done some other things in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I used to work in the audio engineering department there. Yeah. Wow, I'll have to ask him because um, it's been so long. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. remember he was, you know, this great musician, and one day he left for school. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. But where, it was where good. Did you, where, where are you from again? Originally Florida? Or? No, um, Fort Worth, Texas, and and oh, I grew okay. up in playing music. You know, and first in Arlington, a suburb there, and that's where I met this friend of mine, Frank, who I'm actually still really close to, and. Uh, as, as fate would have it, you know, I've, I'm one of the many who has started recording at home, something I've been wanting to do for decades and he's been recording at home forever. And so I'm having the first, for the first time, an opportunity to, to do some things with him. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometime when, when you have time, I'll have to talk to you about my recording gear I got and the fun I'm having and the things I'm trying to learn just to whatever. I, I know it would be fun to, to talk mm -hmm. chat with you just about. Tell me a time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, well, speaking of which, um, creating home studios at home, I also am weaving into the article is becoming increasingly important, has been, and, and I guess maybe this uh, crisis that we're in is sort of accelerating it. Would you agree with that? Or, and, and do you have thoughts on that? Have you seen it any? Yeah. I mean, the, more than ever, you know, and it goes beyond the recording. It's going, you know, again, because we can do now everything. We can do all the way to distrib distribution. We can, we can get everything inside our laptop done. And that's pretty amazing. Yep. I know. I can't, I can't believe how long I waited, but um, anyway, mm -hmm. I'm just happy I finally did it. I, you know, as soon as you get started, you're like, man, I sure would like to upgrade those mics, get another crash cymbal and a nice snare. <laughs> <laughs> of those overhead mics every I, it's, i've been lucky it's been working out well um and uh how about digital distribution um and I, I feel like when i talk to people like you you know these things are like well of course um but maybe you you know like i do a lot of musicians that really haven't been touching a lot of these things yet or they're just starting to but um do you think digital distribution and understanding how that works is going to, I mean, it will continue to be important, yes? Yeah, I mean, we don't have virtual mega stores anymore and Tower Records, so what else is there? Um, you could do it by yourself, but it's, it's, for, it's, such a, it's kind of a fair deal. I'm considering well, how, much, how little the percentages you give up to distributor to get it into iTunes and Spotify and all these places and 100 other outlets. It's such a no-brainer, yeah. And it's not hard. To, that's really one of the easiest things. I know. I saw, um, I'm forgetting the name now. You know, when I first started doing the podcast, I was like, oh, these CD babies kind of turned into one of the places you can go to help you with distribution mm -hmm. um, onto the platforms. And then I discovered another one recently and just so happened a guest I had at the time said she she chose that one. And I talked to one or two other people with it. And I'm like, oh, this has gotten incredibly easy, which is what you just said. Was it DistroKit? Or yeah, it? yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've been using them for the last few releases. And you, and you like it? 
I have nothing bad to say. Um, the only negative thing I read about it is that they keep sometimes money if you're outside the country. Um, as, but that's a normal thing sometimes, as, you know, as a, they hold tax back. So just be aware of that. But other than that, it's, if, you, if they do, that means you're making money. So it's, it's, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> uh, yeah. So are they U.S.-based? I don't know. The U.S. based. The f former, the former, I think Derek Silvers, who used to found or used to run um, CD Baby, actually proclaimed this was the best new kid on the block. Oh, I'll have to email him and ask. He, uh, he's they're funny. Very they're very, very smart technology wise, so they don't need a lot of overhead people. Cool. Because it's a lot of algorithmic stuff they're doing to, to just make it simple. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll have to look for that. And uh, Derek Sivers is funny. Um, he's very giving of his time and, you know, with email and stuff. He, anytime I oh, good. respond to him, he sends a message back. You know, I've tried to get him on the podcast, but he hasn't been doing interviews for a while. And I think now, of course, he wants to get on big platforms now that he is doing yeah. it. But, um, and I think my observation has been that the arc of a career in music is is growing longer and longer. Um and I guess what I mean by that is uh, it's, it's a longer game than it was. And there's some upside to that in that, you know, maybe I haven't written this or anything, but it's just kind of coming out as I'm telling, sharing this thought with you. But uh, maybe those, entre those entrepreneurial artists that we talk about are less inclined to be a quote unquote one hit wonder or something like today's version of that because. Uh, if they can maintain, you know, quality music and product that the arc of their career, there are just so many options now because it's more of an entrepreneurial venture. What, what do you think about that? The question is if the arc is longer than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's true due to the fact that you really need stamina to make this work. And so either you fall off the plate because it's just too much work until they actually you see some money coming back. There's always, of course, exceptions of breaks and some people, you know, but that's always the, the minority, the 0.1%. But if you want to build it, I think it's worth keeping it and doing it, but it takes, you know, a few years to just start building your audience and your community. So it's, yes, that will give you longevity. And I don't think people care how old you are, if the quality is good if you build that niche audience. I, I was wondering about this, um, thinking that that's probably the case, you know, and me being, I think you and I are kind of close in age. I don't re remember, but I'm like, I just turned 56 in May. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm that's like, true. you know, I don't think people care that much anymore. Um, unless you are someone who already has um, celebrity or has, or is doing, there's this artist named Sia that has having like a second um, uh, you know, 2.0 version of her career, and she's chosen this time to keep her face hidden, basically, um, mm -hmm. a stra you know, an intentional strategy. But but she's unique, I think, for people like myself who's you know me. I'm finally writing music, and you know, and if I stay productive and and do the work and all that, I don't know that anybody's going to care. Like you said, there's a niche audience, and so I think there was always the. It would have always worked, but because the, the labels were the gatekeepers, they just filtered things out and wanted to make these sort of more artificially cloned artists because they thought they could market it to a younger audience and that would be the moneymaker and all that stuff. But I think mainstream radio is a good point for that. But then there was things, if you're familiar with NPRs or KCRW and all these radio stations, who always went the other way and proven, proven that there are so many other great artists and people want to hear them that are not mainstream per se. And now with YouTube and all these platforms, even more so people, a lot of people care about something real rather than, you know, being modeled after, you know, like that perfect stereotypical image that we, yeah. you know. So yeah, absolutely. Do you, ha do you have any, based on the, mm, the theme of the conversation here, you know, the, the change in, what it means to be an independent artist now versus whatever 10 or 20 years ago. Do you have any other thoughts that, you know, sort of subtopics I haven't thought of or just things that you think are important for people to hear? I think 
Look, my, one of my biggest challenges is that you've got to be really patient with yourself because you can't possibly learn everything in a short amount of time. And there's always more. I mean, it's insane. It's like if you would go to a second grader and slap all the curriculum of the next six years or 10 years in front of them, it would be just stopping them and traumatizing them, right? So I feel sometimes like that. If you, someone says, okay, you got to learn video editing, um, all the marketing aspects. Are, then you got to make amazing music and find time to practice to play life. It's, it's, it's a lot of things. So you have to sort of give yourself, cut yourself some slack. So be consistent and patient with yourself and but then also not go crazy because like you can always do more as an entrepreneur or a self-employed musician and you're just like okay this month this year i'm going to focus on this but for example i took 2018 i started i bought a couple of marketing classes and just like let me learn about marketing this is something i don't know about but it seems so logical that you can do it online yourself i mean i get it and understand it and i get it to a certain level then maybe i can hire other people to help me with that but I need to understand it. And so like, you gotta give yourself chunks of time to focus on it. Like you say, I wanna learn recording. Okay, give yourself half a year and do that, but don't expect it to be perfect right away. Yeah, I feel, <laughs> and Mike, that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, that thought. I yeah. feel on the recording thing, I feel really lucky because I know drums are not one of the easier things to record, acoustic drums. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, on, uh, to be completely honest, uh, and I have a, had a lot of challenges with the room and all this, but sonically, I couldn't have asked for a better, much of a better beginning because I'm, you know, so novice at it. But, you know, the only thing that I, I, I made a joke about it earlier, the only thing I wish I had right now are, are you know, better overhead mics and a, and a better snare drum. And then maybe that crash cymbal, but other, otherwise I'm, I'm feeling like I got a good start. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to show you about uh, sample replacement or just like a layering a drum with different sounds. You know? I'd love that. Yeah. I'd love that. Um, I've been thinking about it, but I've been trying, so I'm trying to get through the song and I, I really, luckily I got a, a guy that I admire a lot interested in the song. That's that, um, is a, an engineer and musician. And so he's, you know, he's working with me on it, which I, I, I needed the musician really bad. And it's just a bonus that he's an engineer uh, as well, recording engineer. But, um, where was I going with that? I don't know. I've lost my trend of thought. Anyway, I'm, I'm lucky that happened. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I have, oh, I know what I wanted to say is I've been trying to not get too preoccupied with, um, any too much beyond making the raw sound as good as I can possibly make it. And then I'll kind of move on to <laughs> trying to learn mm -hmm. to do some of those things, but I would love to, to hear your, hear, uh, any tips that you have on that or resources I should look at for that. That sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Sounds Do you cool. use, what DAW you, are you using? Um, Logic Pro 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I went and bought myself just a, um, a Scarlett 18i20 so I could have ample channels for the drum kit. And I'm in the process of, I mentioned this, I think last time we talked, I'm, I'm putting this Udemy course together. This is what my last three months were about. Um, and I'm writing a song, producing it from beginning to end. And so I do a lot of mixing, you know, like, like a lot of these processes, you know, so um, what I don't do is acoustic drums in that one, but, but still there's some, some, I could do a video on replacing drum sounds, acoustic drum sounds or layering them with, with samples, just really great thing. Easy yeah. to do. Now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think about this a lot for the snare. Like that's one thing I, um, I don't have a, you know, like an expensive, nice snare. It doesn't sound shitty. In fact, it sounds surprisingly good, but um, I thought, you know, if I knew how to do it, I would just layer a little something on top of that just to make it sound a little sweeter, but it doesn't sound bad at all. So You can do it in a few clicks if you know how in, in logic, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, keep me posted on the course. I'm glad you brought that up um, because uh, it's something I think worth kind of exploring for another article and some, I've certainly talked to many people there's a couple of gals I've talked to you, you might find interesting just to look at, but um, mm -hmm. Ari, Ariana Cap, she has a, I think her, her favorite place to send people is Ari's base blog. It's A-R-I, Ari's base blog. And then she does, a, she's a big into to teaching online and she's a very accomplished 
a musician. And then the other one, another accomplished musician that I just kind of met her name, she goes by the name Juno and she's creating um, guitar courses on YouTube. I think on the platform uh, kind of tech side, she might, I don't know though, there's argument for she could completely do it on YouTube, but I think she's a little behind the curve on that, but she has a huge, she has a big audience already. Mm -hmm. Huge. So yeah, cool. anyway, I've seen her on yours. Yeah. Yep. Um, thank you uh, for your time. I'm sorry I was late. I, I, I really appreciate you uh, spending a little extra time with me and keep me posted on your Udemy course and I'll let you know. Uh, I'm not even sure. I was thinking with this episode, I was going to put a couple of you together, but I think I have these really lovely kind of vignettes. I can just do somewhat smaller episodes with these. So you may see that you'll be in another standalone, but I'll, I'll let you know as soon as it's out. Okay, cool. Let Thanks. me know. Thanks, man. I'll stay safe and you know, good luck with everything. You too. It was really great talking with you. This episode was powered by ConvertKit. More than just an email marketing company, ConvertKit is focused on landing pages too, giving beginner creators everything they need to start building their email list. I've been a ConvertKit user since early 2016, and I love it. Their new free plan allows creators to make unlimited landing pages and forms. With ConvertKit, you can choose from multiple templates, add personalization and design, include an incentive email, create thank you pages, manage subscribers, and send broadcast emails. The support and educational resources offered by ConvertKit are top-notch too. That's important to me. It should be to you as well. To learn how ConvertKit can help you connect with your audience so that you can make a living doing the work you love, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash convert or look for the link in the show notes for this episode. If you have feedback, questions, comments, suggestions about the podcast, my guests, me, please visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash feedback. You can leave me a quick voicemail right there on that page, right from your browser. All my other contact info is there too, and I'd love to hear from you. Find links for just about everything talked about in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening and sharing with your friends. Peace, gratitude, and a whole lot of love.